Thank you so much for this opportunity to share stories of language, languaging, and linguistics. I'd like to begin with one of the epiphanies that I had, and it happened in December 2000, oh, 2003, when me and my daughter in the Santa Monica Pier were looking, I was looking to put her on the kitty ride, and she decided that she liked the Ferris wheel instead. And she looked at the Ferris wheel and pointed and said, that's fun tar. As a linguist, I became very excited by that. <laughs> I said, wow, fun tar. Then she, her eye caught the roller coaster. And she said, no, I want to go on that one. That's fun tar tar. I said, great. This is the greatest day of my life. This was the moment I was looking for as a linguist. All the, all the literature reviews, all the research, everything that I had read about other people's children, now I was experiencing it. So a quick lesson. She took an English word, fun, that's the IPA transcription, compounded with a Persian morphology meaning more, and then did something totally never done in the history of the universe and created another degree of moreness. <laughs> Fun tar tar. That's the roller coaster. And thus she created a new Persian word, never ever seen in any of the King of Kings dictionary, and a new American word, never seen in the Oxford dictionary. I guess it could be defined as more fun, but even more fun. But I prefer this version of what this new linguistic construction meant. But I was a little bit concerned, a little worried, and quite frankly, a little scared. I said, wow, this was a great moment, a great language moment. What would happen if she went to school? What would happen on a test that didn't recognize this new language? It's not in a dictionary, it's not in a grammar book, but it was her voice, her unique voice. This was, for me, an epiphany of radical linguistics, that we are not mice in a maze chasing cheese. We are not simply imi imitating what we see in our environment. We are creative beings making a new language. Each human being has a unique utterance, a unique voice. But the system that we have, what she had done was shown us a possibility of joining the king's English with the king of kings Persian. Two empires joined together. Empires that had been war warring for hundreds of years. The Battle of Thermopylae over and over again with every chapter of conflict. And that is the world that she was going into. This is why I was concerned and scared. That the world she's going into, the linguistic system she's going into, will force her to choose between either fun or tar. And there's no room for fun tar tar. It's a difficult choice. It is a choice that is not available to countless students growing up in multilingual homes, multilingual communities, creating new language all the time. But our schools and our society is geared towards the lowest common denominator. You have to pick your flag. You have to pick your language. It is the axiom of linguistics that language matters, that all language matters, but does it really? This is something that we have to think about. In the early 60s, Lambert and his colleagues began experiments called the Match Guys Experiments. They had the same readers of language, one, read, one would read the text using a standard voice, 
a standard English voice, a standard white voice. And then that same reader would read the same text using black English vernacular. And consistently, people would rate the person who had the black English vernacular as being less intelligent, less beautiful, less capable, less articulate. And this experiment, these experimental studies were repeated over and over again, generation after generation with different language varieties, Chicano English, the use of Spanish, over and over again, people would consistently rate the language of the dominant class as the better language, the better person, the better life. All languages matter? The linguists say yes. But the reality on the ground is something very different. We tend to prefer one language over another. We saw this case in Oakland, 1996, just a few years before my daughter was born. Educators in Oakland had decided that they're going to bring this issue they wanted to pass a resolution and say that black language matters, Ebonics matters. Black language counts. We should be able to use this to educate our children. This controversy made its way all the way to Capitol Hill. Peter King on the floor of the House of Representatives said, Ebonics is not a language. Ebonics is the ab absurd conclusion of political correctness run amok. Arlen Specter tried to temper that view citing his own immigrant parents speaking Yiddish. Yiddish is like the black English of Germany. Citing that language, he said, you know what? Maybe Ebonics is a language. But it was too complicated. That's how they resolved the debate. They chose not to talk about it at all, just saying it's complicated. We found the same thing recently in our own research, talking to school leaders. We asked school leaders of predominant African-American schools. We gave them texts from Toni Morrison, from Maya Angelou. We said, what do you think about this language? What would you call this language? They called it 29 different things. They called it vernacular. They called it slang. They called it their language. They called it not proper. The list goes on. Still, it's complicated. In their book, their seminal work, Articulate by Black, Sammy Aleem and Geneva Smitherman trace the campaign of Barack Hussein Obama and how he style shifted his way to the White House and how articulate he was. And still, his identity and who he is is questioned. Do all languages matter? Ideally, yes, but it's complicated. It's very complicated. <clears throat> to my daughter and the world that they're coming into, this is the question now. Do black lives matter? Does black language matter? And to that, we have to revisit a historical episode. Not too long ago, in his book, Linguistics and the Third Reich, Christopher Hutton talks about the same kind of debates that was going on in the 30s in Germany. Linguists ask the question, does Yiddish matter? Is Yiddish a language? After all, Yiddish was a hybrid form. It was the fun tar tar language of the ghettos in Germany. In fact, ghetto is a Yiddish word, right? They were asking that question. Does Yiddish matter? This hybrid of Slavic, Aramaic, Hebrew, and German. They looked at its history and its relationship to the Hochdeutschsprache, the high German language. And they said, this is not really the high German language. It's not a language. We can't call it a language because it's not pure German. And soon after that, Yiddish-speaking students were reprimanded, stigmatized, ostracized, marginalized in the educational system of German schools. And within a few short years, they were greeted 
by the high German phrase, Arbrecht macht frei, work shall set you free. And they exited through the chimneys. Yes, it's complicated. It's complicated. No, it's not complicated. That day, December 2003, my daughter taught me one thing very clearly, that it is we who are complicating it. It is as simple as seeing the scales in a different way. We are being pulled down by the inertia of monolingualism and monoculturalism. And how can we reimagine a new linguistic future? It's as simple as fun, tar, tar. Something I learned from my own daughter and by watching what kids do in schools all the time with language. Let me share with you a story of three people who took a journey of language and languaging seriously. Pat McCluskey, Zioni Torres, and Pat's mom, Marianne. They decided to leave monolingual heaven and travel into the northern Soto region of South Africa. As part of the Peace Corps, this was part of their efforts to decenter themselves and learn a new language and new, learn a new people and learn about themselves. Pat was the first white person to go into this village after apartheid had ended in 1994. In fact, none of the people, none of the locals would take him in. They said, what are we going to do with a white man? The sting and stench of apartheid was still alive on a cultural level. Finally, a man named Comfort, the village chief, invited Pat into his home. And he invited him with this phrase, Leka, which is the northern Soto meaning, where are you? It's translated as how are you, but it's not really that. And Pat explained this to me in very vivid terms. He said, the first day that I was teaching English, I went there to teach English, and class started at 9 o'clock. No one came till 9.30. I know we talk about that as being like people of color time and all these kind of things, but that's not really what it was. He says, Le car. He says they, said, they said to me very simply, he says, look, on our way to class, we ran into people we knew. And they would say, Leka, where are you? And so we told them. We gave them the full story of who we are, where we've been, what problems we have, what complications are go we're going through. It says, from that day forward, class started when it was supposed to start. I wasn't worried about killing time, wasting time. Com no more were we going to compartmentalize time. Let it be. I learned a new world view, a new world order. Through the bottle shops, by watching people make maize, by interacting and stepping out of our comfort zones and languaging and learning new ways of being, our lives were transformed. So the answer to Leka was much more complex as well. Ke a le boha, meaning thank you, I am with you, expressing solidarity, expressing relational oneness. This is the benefit of languaging. This is radical linguistics in action. This is what it will take for our nation to heal itself from 400 years of separation and linguistic apartheid. Yes, language matters. All languages matter, but all languages will only matter when we start to protect and defend the languages that are in danger. Out of the 6,500 languages in the world, only 200 really matter. The rest are all endangered because we don't think they have something valuable to add. So to my daughter, I, I conclude and I said, I want you to continue to have fun. I want you to continue to make fun tar. And I want you to continue to make fantartar, 
even though there will be consequences, you're going to have to learn how to be a way forward for this world. So in the end, I'd like to thank you. Todaraba, gracias, danyavad, apke shukri, shukran. Thank you very much.